I did so many things that it was hard for the mathematicians to keep track of what he was doing. Uh, but it was then rediscovered uh, in the 1960s by Edward Lorentz. So Edward Lorentz was doing some, um, some study of uh, meteorology. He was uh, trying to solve a simplified version of the equations of meteorology. And, and the way he did that was by doing simulations. <laughs> now at some point he, he had a simulation with some in, initial input that was 0 0.56304 and he got a, a certain trajectory. And then he redid the experiment, but with 0.563, he just neglected the, the very small terms, right? What effect can it have? Well, at first, nearly none. Uh, the two trajectories here, the red and blue one, are nearly the same. But give it enough time, and the trajectories were very different, were suddenly very apart. And this is a phenomenon that appears in meteorology. And this is the core of chaos theory. If you have slight variation in the initial inputs, then in the long run, it can create huge, huge difference. <coughs> now, this was beautifully characterized by uh, Edward Lorenz as the butterfly effect. Uh, he asked the question, does the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil which creates a slow, a slight variation in the initial input, instead of a tornado in Texas. It is possible that the butterfly's wings is the one thing that could make this huge difference. And this really showed how difficult meteorology was. The studies, how difficult the study of the motion of fruits are. And this is characterized by the fundamental equation of fluid dynamics, which is the Navier-Stokes equation. And this Navier-Stokes equation is extremely hard to understand. And part of it is because it's extremely chaotic. In fact, so there's a lot we don't understand about this equation. Uh, and one key question is, does it even have a solution? <clears throat> now, like for instance, if you imagine a huge mass of air that moves through space and that hurts some, some, some obstacle, then some weird things happen, which are very hard to describe. Like for instance, in this picture, when the, the mass of air hits the, the air turbines, you see some weird things happening. These are called turbulences. And what's so... Now, what is, it, what is it that's so dangerous, that's so weird about these turbulences? Well, if you look at these turbulences, the kind of structure you see is a fractal structure, once again. It's a very fractal structure. In fact, if you do fractals, fractals are the best way to generate some, uh, uh, some structures that look like turbulences. But a, a fractal is an object that has the same complexity at all scales, which means that, well, it's already complicated here at, at all scales. We see that uh, some mass of air will be moving from left to right, and just underneath some mass of air will be moving in the other direction. But this kind of phenomenon, because this is fractal, if it is fractal at least, then it's also the case at the lower scales. scales. Particularly it's the case the scales of particles. But this equation isn't fit to describe the particles. This equation describes the motion of a, a certain number of particles which kind of average out to be able to define some velocity and some pressure. But this means that this equation is no longer fit to describe turbulences. It breaks down. So, so we kind of know that this will break down in certain conditions. But characterizing what are the conditions for this equation to break down, and characterizing whether when there's the right, the simplest kind of condition, will it break down or not? These are known as the Navier-Stokes existence and, smoothness, and smoothness problem, and it's also one of the seven millennium prize problem. It's also worth a million dollars. And what makes it so hard is is this chaotic phenomenon. 
Okay, so at this point you might be thinking, okay, chaos theory is about these complicated, huge equations right here. Uh, but in fact, chaos theory appears even with very simple rules. And this was something that's already shown, was shown by the Mandelbrot set we talked in the previous talk. But it's also described here by Stephen Wolfram. So Stephen Wolfram is a recent mathematician, it's a leading mathematician who, uh, who uh, is the founder of Mathematica. And he worked a lot on these kinds of algorithms like here. Uh, so this is known as rule 30. Uh, what does it say? Well, we had this initial state here, uh, which is the first line. And at each point of the algorithm, you're going to compute the next line. How do you do that? Well, the next line, for each square of the next line, so let's take this one, for instance. You look at the three squares that are above it. And then you look at these rules here to decide whether you're going to color your square in black or not. So for instance, for this square here, there are three whites above him. So this corresponds to this pattern. So we color it in, in white. So those are very simple rules, very, very, very basic rules. And yet, when you apply with this very simple initial state, these simple rules, after a few iterations, the, the kind of structure you get, it seems, well, it seems that there's no pattern emerging from that. There's not much to say about that. It was shown that this system was very chaotic, which means that if you slightly change the initial state, you can end up with something totally different afterwards. Okay, so simple rules, even the simplest rules, generate chaos. Now this led uh, Stephen Wolfram to introduce a new concept, which is known as computational irreducibility. It's the idea that even when you have simple rules, when I give you an initial state, and even if you already know the simple rules, it's going to be impossible for you to predict the end state. Well, actually, there's a way you just run the algorithm. You just apply the method line by line. But suppose I give you the first line here, and I tell you to predict this last line here. Well, it's going to take you a while. And the key idea is that there's no faster way to, to know what's going, what's going, what the outcome is going to be than by simply running the algorithm. In particular, uh, Stephen Wolfram posed the question, is our own universe computationally irreducible? This would mean that, if, if it is, it would mean that even if I know the particles of all the, part of all, the position of all the particles and the velocities right now, and I know the, and I knew the fundamental laws of physics, there would be no way for me to predict the weather is going to be in 10 years on a particular day except by just watching time flow. In other words, our universe might be fundamentally unpredictable, even if, even if the laws, the basic laws are very simple. Now this leads me to uh, mathematical physics. I will use the, the first questions of mathematical physics. And in this section now, I'm going to focus on two important questions of mathematical physics. The first one is the debate over deterministic versus uh